my therapist told me I needed to like get more fresh air and today I've been outside for most of the time. I've been walking a lot now. My body wants to stay in bed more, so I'll get up and I'll fight it. Walk to this door, and if I can walk to that door yesterday, I'm gonna walk to that door even farther than that door the next day. I'm like complaining about my money situation to you, and you have cancer, so god damn it, now I feel like a dumbass. Life just happens and there's nothing you can do about it. It's all about the journey, it's gonna be something that's gonna inspire so many people. Or you told me that you had your last, uh, your last chemo treatment. When you're done with chemo, it doesn't mean you're done with cancer. That's only the beginning, dude, to be honest. But I'm writing my testimony right now. I'm gonna speak in front of the church. That's such big news for you, man. I know, it's big. Seeing a hundred people in person in front of you, that's like actually crazy. It was really meaningful. I touched a lot of hearts today. You've always wanted to inspire other people, right? And I did. It felt so great to have just the reassurance. This kid that's like a sophomore, he went up to me and shook my hand. And he's like, thank you for coming up there today. I can see you my best friend, bro. It's fucking cool seeing you fought this thing. You're looking good. You're just looking so much better now. You're, I'm proud to be your friend, and I'm happy that I get to be in your life. When your lung collapses on your birthday, I get to go travel the world and have all this fun and then lose in the hospital. You can't control my sickness. You have a life of your own. You gotta take care of yourself. I love you, bro. Thanks for calling. Gosh, man, I love you, bro. I've dedicated myself, and I want to continue inspiring. You're already inspirational to me. Oh man, it's getting me a sore throat. I didn't sleep last night, bro. It didn't give me a watery eye. How many surgeries do you think you've gone through? Three lung surgeries, and then I got the three other really gnarly ones. But you're averaging a surgery every three months right now. If the treatment stops working, did they give you a timeline on like when this thing could spread? And Basically, just be sleeping all day, every day, in a bed and just waiting to die. Holy oh, fuck, man. You're only 26. That's what I told them. So, you're really gonna tell this to the 26 year old one that really wants to put up a mess and fighting through all this for two years? I just don't understand how you haven't lost hope yet. Like, you just. Never. I will ever lose hope. Never think your life is over because that's when your own body is gonna actually think. When you die, you don't lose to cancer. You beat cancer in how you live, why you live, and in the manner in which you live. I literally have no visitors. Nobody comes to see me. Um, and I reached out. I reached out three times now through my whole entire contact list. And all they say is, I'm sorry. Have you had a visitor since you moved back to your dad's house? Like one. My friend Jack asked me to call him, which is very concerning because honestly, me and Jack never call, so. Good morning, man. Where are you? I'm currently in the Philippines right now. What the? I got this tattoo from the oldest tattoo artist in the world, and it says Luke in their native language. There is a reason for my phone. Um, I hate to be like the bearer of bad news or whatever, but Luke. So many of my friends have died, like, what is the point of me traveling the world, taking away my time from them? I'm not even making any, like, true connections, it feels like, because I, I can only stay in a place for such a short amount of time. This place, I, mean, I didn't even get to see anything because I was just fucking depressed the entire time because of my friend dying. Like, what? I, I, I didn't get to see anything. They say all good things fall apart. At first, my time in the Philippines had felt like a thousand coincidences had just fallen so perfectly in place. I am willing to make the argument that Filipino people are the nicest people in the world. A male model slid into my DMs and offered me to stay in his house in Manila. And when he took me out partying, 
I met so many new friends. Where are you taking me? Welcome to the rabbit hole. <laughs> In the middle of the night, a girl came up to me at the club and introduced herself. Turns out we were both from California, except she had moved here a year before, and I had just got here, but I was looking for friends. That night, she invited me back to her apartment. But I think I just have to restart a community. I was scared when I first moved here, but and then now, now I have a community. Do you live on the entire sixth floor? That's why I think we stay sorority on six, because it's a bunch of girls on the sixth floor. Lisa lived with a bunch of girls that called themselves sorority on six. And these people kind of became everything I ever wanted in Manila. My first time in many months feeling like I had a community. And these were the special type of friends that actually hit you up first to hang out. They convinced me to stay in Manila, and I was lucky enough to find a beautiful apartment to stay in. You're the first person to live here. <laughs> Guys, I am reading my first rental contract. This is very exciting because I'm only staying for one. Day. For the first 10 days, I was promised I'd have Wi-Fi, but it never was installed. I thought the Wi-Fi was the worst of all my issues that month, but right afterwards, Luke died. I'm just a shitty person to be honest. Like, I knew my friend has been sick this entire time, and when he went to hospice, I should have been there to be with him. He never even got to see the fucking tattoo. I'm angry at myself, feeling stupid that I could have come home earlier, spent more time with him. I don't want to live like this anymore. Luke didn't even know that I'd kept my word. I'd hiked into the mountain villages of the Philippines to get his name inked. During this time, I was so depressed, I stopped working. I made Ponce create the videos for TikTok and Instagram. And during that time, our views dropped so low, it felt like my career was ending. The only person I talked to was my therapist. She told me to take whatever time I needed for myself. For the next 10 days, I isolated myself in my apartment, just waiting for Luke's funeral. You know, my therapist and I were talking about like my goals, and she's like, you know, every single thing that you've ever told me you wanted to do, you ended up doing it. I don't want other people to do that. Everyone's a pussy. <laughs> there are people out there that don't want to do that, want to do this. You just say it, and you do it. And it doesn't matter about money or the price of things or... Erica gave me this cup. I know. And she literally said, oh, I thought you were a gym bro. Bitch, you can't even get this in. Usually when you ghost people, they stop trying. But Erica was different. She was one of the girls in sorority on six and was putting so much effort to be my friend even after I told her that I was struggling with my mental health. I think most people would normally find this annoying, but I found it quite sweet. It got to the point where Erica insisted on coming over and making me burgers. And after 10 days of isolation, she came over quite frequently. I'm actually shocked how much time we spent together and she still didn't even know why I was depressed. How are you? God, it's been, what, two weeks now? Yeah. After spending a little bit of time with Erica, I realized how much I missed human interaction. So when Roger invited me to one of her family parties, I was really in need of some wholesome festivities. Hanging out with them seemed much happier than watching adult actresses alone in my apartment. I will say the Roger subplot is one of the most interesting I've ever experienced. Dylan, I got catfished. Oh, f you did not. Yeah, I did. It's about time, honestly. Oh I had just moved to a new city, threw up an IG story, and I get this wholesome message from a guy named Roger. Roger says, I can show you great places to drink tonight if you're free. Promise to not be a weirdo. For the next few days, I got really busy, didn't check my phone. But in this time, Roger is persistent. Quadruple DM'd me. And I am a person that appreciates effort. A few days later, I couldn't stay in my apartment because there was work being done. The only friend I know in the country has yeah. to leave. So I asked Roger, if I could crash at his place. Roger seems chill, says I can sleep in the guest room. But before I go over to a random stranger's house, I'm like, I need to FaceTime you first. Keep in mind, we don't know what Roger looks like because his account is private. So I call him and this is Roger. I mean, what? Uh, yes! Wait, you got catfish in the other way? In the other way! <laughs> go f*** yourself. <laughs> Roger is actually a she named Marla. And Marla is the sweetest, smartest girl. We talked about anime, our relationship with our parents, the political state of the world. The next day, my friend needs a ride, so Marla decides to drive an hour through traffic to drop him off at the airport. Then she took me out to dinner at Din Tai Fung. <laughs> and she even tried to pay for me. I had to throw her credit card away. <laughs> Afterwards, she takes me home. Her house is huge. This looks like a mansion. And the bed. Hi guys, this is my room. Thank you so much. We've been traveling all over, so I hadn't slept in a real bed in so long. Kind of crazy the people you meet online <laughs> if you put yourself out there. Why did you message me as Roger? Because I had a stalker for a while, so most of my socials had to be under a different name. Oh, interesting. And I thought that if I guised myself as a guy, the stalker would least likely think. Oh. Least likely to find me. Yeah. But yeah. 
How did you meet this person? Like, did, did you ever meet no. them in person? No, never. They found you online? Yeah. This is the first time ever a girl has ever like pretended to be a guy. What? Yeah, I don't know. Really? I don't know any girls that DM me under the pretense of like... No, but that's not my fake account, okay? That's actually my real account. I have no... Yeah, that's crazy. It's not my fake Insta. It's I know, it's your real Insta. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Account. I'm very glad that instead of running alone in my apartment waiting to fly back to America, I decided to open myself to seeing people. I just wanted to give a shout out to Jennifer, my therapist. I've been in therapy for a little bit over a year now, and I'm very stoked to say that this video is sponsored by something I use every other week, BetterHelp. BetterHelp is an online platform that helps you get connected to a therapist. Now, finding a perfect therapist is super hard. I ghosted my first therapist. Don't do what I did. If you don't get along with your first therapist, you can switch really easily. That's how I met Jennifer. You fill out a quick survey and they match you with someone in their huge network. I prefer video calls because it feels like there's more of a connection, but if you don't want a video call, you can always just do a regular call. And if that's a little overwhelming, you can even just text back and forth. I never thought I'd do therapy because my family doesn't really believe in mental health, but the thought process that changed my mind was that people don't go to the gym just because they're really out of shape. People go to the gym to maintain good shape. So for therapy, I don't just go because I was struggling with my mental health, but I continue to still use therapy because I'm trying to maintain good mental health. Last year, I was in Africa, Asia, and Europe. Going to a physical therapist is impossible. Also, the BetterHelp app auto updates the time zone you're in. I'm genuinely so freaking proud to promote a platform that basically saved my life. If you click on the link in the description, it tells BetterHelp that this is a good ad. So if you want to support this channel, click on the link in the description, and it also gives you 10% off your first month of therapy. All right, guys, back to the video. Close your eyes. Okay, give me your Don't hand. Don't kiss me. No, no, no. I'm Just sick. Just give me your hand. Okay. Just feel this. Don't even talk. Okay. Just feel it. Oh, I'm just enjoying our late night and talking. I'm talking about her. Thank you so much. She really nice to meet you. I've enjoyed your monthly. We hung out like two or three times. It felt like once a month. I feel sad because like I didn't get to spend that much time with you. Oh yeah, I know. I've seen you like once. I love you. This is what you give people. Yeah, such a bright smile. Ladies and gentlemen, like that, I welcome aboard going to Los Angeles, California. My name's Craig now, there's 72 degrees, light winds. It's gonna be an emotional few days, not gonna lie, but we'll get through. So apparently we're supposed to wear bright clothes. Did my hair for the first time. Even use products. Are you nervous or no? Of course. <laughs> of course I'm nervous. I'm so nervous. You only have one time to speak at your best friend's funeral. Yeah. Right? So it's like, if I fuck up, it's permanently. <laughs> How are you? Just you? got in this morning. Really? I love this so much. You <laughs> march right in there to the very top. They want to get you all situated. The first day we met at the hospital, he actually kept tracking jokes that he probably died first of the bland hospital food. <laughs> Dude, no. What is it? It's the same thing I've eaten every single day. Ooh, a cookie. <laughs> the second day we met, his nurse had to shave off all his hair. She said she was honored to do it. Luke said that he was happy to be more aerodynamic. <laughs> we hung out almost every day that first week, which was extremely difficult because he was only allowed two guests per day because of COVID. But on some days, we were able to sneak in a few more, which led to me actually being banned at the hospital for a bit. So <laughs> Luke was overwhelmingly positive about his chemo. It seemed his only worry in the world was supporting himself. So and this part always makes him tear up a bit. But through word of mouth of the Newport Beach community and a small TikTok video I made that somehow reached 5 million people, we were able to raise about $23,000 for him. Since Luke was spending so much time at home or at the hospital, Adrian, uh, Luke's dad, and I all pitched him some money and renovated his living room. Luke was mostly happy to play with his brand new Xbox, and I was mostly excited to sleep on his brand new couch when we got through that. During those three months I spent back in Newport, we hung out every day basically, talking about how we would travel the world together next year, maybe meet a few girls and settle down somewhere in Europe. Last year I flew back to the US to surprise him. I brought my friend Farhan, and even though he was on his oxygen machine, 
Luke said, I'm still having a hard time breathing knowing that there's a model in my room. <laughs> <laughs> That's the real <laughs> Two models, sorry, Bill. We blushed through this mask, bro. <laughs> Luke Mueller is probably the strongest person I've ever met. This man had to deal with his catheter, his chemo, three surgeries, and Germany losing the World Cup. <laughs> Despite this all, Luke always put his friends first. When old friends would visit from high school, he'd pretend like the pain didn't bother him at all. Behind closed doors, he was suffering. It's so funny. Dude, I had to call the emergency doctor. Really? I can't even eat my breakfast. Look at this shit. It's like tomato Holy sauce. shit. I'm not feeling good, man. He would be in so much pain, but he didn't want anyone else to have to feel that pain with him. And so, I don't know if, if you would have been able to capture that. I mean, I know he wanted to share everything, but there's a part of him that would not have been comfortable if you were uncomfortable with him. Because when you're with him, he wants you to be better. After his third surgery, Lou said sitting down on the bed was like sitting down on shards of glass. Lou would sometimes call me delirious because he hadn't had sleep for many days because of his medication. But throughout all this craziness, the same message was clear. We were going to travel the world together when he got better. Uh, but I want to say that no one had more will to live than Luke. When Luke's cancer became terminal, he was upset because he was only 26 years old and felt all the doctors had given up on it. But he was still certain that there would be a miracle. What I'm trying to do on a good note is kill it for good. All the things that the doctors aren't going to do into my own hands, and I'm going to kill it. What I want to say is that I talked to Luke twice a week. And I knew that in the last few months, Luke, he unfortunately didn't have many visitors. Despite this, it doesn't change the history of all the time you and I have all laughed, cried, and shared with him. Luke always said he didn't want to lose to cancer. He didn't want to die. But I think he's wrong. You don't lose when you pass from cancer. You beat cancer in how you live, why you live, and in the manner in which you live. Luke lives on in our hearts and the stories that we share. Luke's biggest dream since I've known him was that he wanted to share his story to inspire the world. Thank you all for supporting Luke to come together in a celebration of Luke's life. The one I was really proud of Luke was at Benson when he had a new girlfriend every month. I thought that was... Anyway, I want to talk a little bit about what it was like being Luke's father. He surprised me by joining the Newport Harbor Band. And I'll never forget that the first show that he had, he was in the back and he had a triangle and he was hitting the little triangle. And he only had to hit it like twice during the whole song. I'm like, that's my boy over there. I think that's my son playing that triangle. Because Luke was so passionate and he was an awesome writer, mm. he would tell me about you know the girls he met and how much he loved them. I have never met a young man on campus that would fall in love as much as Luke. We were driving back and Fonse's like, oh, so Luke got a lot of girls, didn't he? Yes. <laughs> Luke got a lot of girls. Girls visiting him oh, yeah. during his cancer. Yeah, and that's because he wasn't that hit it and quit it kind of guy. When he dated someone, he treated them like they were gold. Out of everyone, I wanted to reach out to you. Aside from his family, almost all of my conversations with Luke, I feel like he talked about you the most. Like Almost like he felt like you had a motherly relationship with him. After his mother passed, Luke became very vulnerable. It was hard for Luke to understand that he was gonna be breaking our hearts when he passed as well. And that was oh, wow. really hard for him to know that he would be causing us that kind of pain. Um, knowing that he was gonna be with his mom again, really truly be with his mom again, meant yeah. a lot. He wasn't afraid of it, but he did feel like he had a lot to say. Luke and I got into an argument six months ago. I told him that I got invited to do a TED talk in Warsaw, Poland, but I said no because I have stage fright. And he called me a fucking pussy. <laughs> Luke told me that it was his biggest dream to inspire people. When Luke passed, I decided to DM the committee to see if they still had another spot open. And luckily, they were able to fit me in. So in one month, I'd be giving a TED talk in honor of my best friend. In the meantime, I celebrated my 27th birthday with my closest friends.
Oh my god. <laughs> Do you like it? This is so weird to be like I've never had a birthday before like this. Yeah, they're both the candles. Are they penises? They're yeah. penises. <laughs> Make um, a wish. You guys are already here. Yeah. It's a shower mounted flashlight. <laughs> That's amazing. A year ago, I met a girl at the airport in Berlin, and we both happened to be flying to New York City. Her name is Mona, and we got to spend an entire day in New York together. It was really wonderful, and after that experience, we tried to meet up so many times afterwards. South Africa, Southeast Asia, but unfortunately, in the entire year since we've seen each other, we could never make it happen. But because the TED Talk was in Warsaw, Poland, Berlin was only a short bus ride away. So I went to go stay with Mona for a week before the TED Talk. Now I've been single since 2017. That's seven years, y'all. And this time, my dating life has been pretty casual. I never really believed I could find someone long term because, well, I'm traveling the world. But I thought, hey, after everything I've been through this year, why not put myself out there? And I know this kind of sounds stupid. Me traveling all the way to Germany for a girl I barely knew. But hey, guys do stupid things for girls all the time. Me, well, I cleaned up got a fresh haircut, some flowers from a local Vietnamese oh, shop, goodness. and I got to spend a week with basically a stranger. Smile. This is my first donair. This is my 700th donair. <laughs> this is huge. Mona taking us to German things. I feel like I'm getting the full German experience right now. <laughs> like how you're already there. <laughs> See you. See you. Mona is a really special person, but I'll just come out and say it right now. This is not a love story. It's more of a reality check. Things didn't work out. I felt like I had so many intense, stressful things happening this year that I just wanted to fall for someone to feel love, to have someone make me feel happy or even just comfortable in this really tough time in my life. I kind of felt like Luke, so much love to give. Sometimes you just have to accept that no matter how cute the story is, if there's no compatibility, things just won't right. work out. Goodbye, German girl. Goodbye. <laughs> Take care, love. Take care. See you soon. Bye -bye. Also around this time, I found out that my realtor in the Philippines stole my security deposit. Can I see it? Yeah, of course. I'm so sorry to hear about you. In that moment, she sat down with me, looked me in the eye, and cried with me. $650 is just gone, apparently. So she blocked your number? Either she blocked me, or she died. It doesn't feel great, I'm not gonna lie. Hi guys, we are on the way to get my fourth tattoo. Last year, I survived an explosion 50 miles from the Russian border. And while I was evacuated out of the country, my friends at Mission Ukraine have spent the past year and a half volunteering. They invited me back on a trip to Kharkiv to see all the houses they were rebuilding. Holy shit. Oh. Holy f While there, I went back to the exact same spot of the explosion to just process everything that happened. This is the spot that I survived an explosion a year and a half ago. Nothing like returning to the place that you almost died to get over a heartbreak. The overall feeling, I'm just grateful to still be breathing. I was feeling inspired to memorialize this moment, so I found this local tattoo artist in Kharkiv. He's absolutely amazing and was able to fit me in that last night. I've made this guy put this on and off four times now. <laughs> <laughs> I think if this was like an eight, this would be like a five. Dude. I know, that right? So fucking cool. Oh, this is the best tattoo yet. He actually kept the entire tattoo parlor open for me when he heard my story. I'm pretty sure this is the most aesthetic tattoo I have. I didn't really want to be here today because I get a little nervous in front of people. But after a small conversation with my friend Luke, he convinced me. Oh, I'm not even clicking this at this point. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here, I'm sorry. I struggled a lot in grade school. And so when high school came around, I knew I needed to study hard to get to university. So I put my head down and I grinded. College admissions came. I got rejected by all 12 universities. To be honest, I actually spent most of my time in grade school doing drugs. Honestly, for me, my breaking point 
was when I was doing Xanax in class and they found me passed out in a pool of drool. My mom, she gave up on me and I conveniently ran away. I was living out of my car at the time at 16 years old. I kind of didn't believe I had a future. I got a call one day and on the other side of the phone was the police. It turns out my dad had called me in his runaway and that day I got escorted home in the back of a police car. My dad, he's probably the best human being I've ever met. You know, no matter how many times I screwed up in my life, my dad was always there for me. He was probably the smartest person I ever met. He was a PhD electrical engineer with 12 different patents in multi-layer fiber optic cables. My life changed when my dad got diagnosed with cancer. My life went from getting high with my friends every single day to living in a hospital room with just me, my dad, and five megabits per second Wi-Fi speed that barely ran my online community college classes. But even on my dad's deathbed, he really challenged me. He pushed me to go to university, get educated, to chase love, to see the world. A few months later, my dad actually got accepted into the UC Irvine Hall of Fame for engineering. I was the one there to accept his award because unfortunately, he passed a few months prior. At the time, I felt like I lost the most important person in my life, the only person that actually believed in me. But around the same time, I got my report card, first one ever straight A's, and that pushed me to keep going. Two years later, I was actually able to transfer to my dream school at UCLA, and two years after that, I got to have the greatest moment of my life. I walked across that stage with my diploma in hand, realizing that I finally was able to make my dad proud. If you want to change your life, you have to find the right people. And for me, that unfortunately meant getting rid of the people around me that made me the worst version of myself. On May 26th, 2022, I was woken up by air sirens, which is really normal in Kharkiv. But today was a little bit different because every 15 minutes, there were explosions. And so we decided to take refuge in a restaurant. And as I got to the restaurant and I opened my van door, there was an explosion so loud that my ears went deaf. There was chaos everywhere. I, um, there was buildings on fire. There were people on the ground crying. There was shrapnel flying everywhere. I tried to help up this lady that was twice as far from the explosion as me. And as I grabbed her up, I saw her clothes pull up in blood. She had been hit by shrapnel. My friend Chris, he had to amputate a man's leg to tourniquet him. Nine people died in this explosion and 19 people were wounded. I don't think I'll ever kind of unsee what I saw. Afterwards, we were evacuated by the military into a safe house. We were there for four days waiting for the explosions to end. And then after that, we were evacuated out of the country. For me, I, I struggled a lot afterwards. For the past year, I've been in therapy and I'm trying to learn a new version of myself. But throughout this experience, I got to be much closer to my best friend, Luke. This past year, his cancer went terminal. And so we've talked a lot about our regrets before death. Just to hammer this point home one more time, the part that broke my heart the most was on a recent call with him. He told me that since his cancer has become terminal, in the past year, none of his old friends visited him. Luke is actually the one that convinced me to do this TED Talk. And last month, we flew back to California for a celebration of life. And I'd like to believe that though his old friends didn't see him, Luke died peacefully knowing that his new friends truly loved him. If I could leave you guys with one thing from this TED Talk, it would be you only have a finite amount of time in this world. Make sure you invest it in the right people. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your personal experiences.